<laughs> I so, love coming here because the people here are so interesting. I, is anybody not wearing shoes? Because that was the best. Last time I was here, I was like, yeah. Shoes optional. You can do anything you want here. <laughs> so Jenny, we'll start with you. Let's start going back several years. What was the spark for Crash Test World? What convinced you of this opportunity? Uh, Crash Test World is kind of 15 years in the making. Um, I started an organization called Project Explorer, and the idea was to use video to bring the world into the classroom. And that started in 2003, so two years before YouTube existed, I was doing online video quite by accident. Uh, over the last 15 years, we've been used in 5,300 schools, so we started talking to um, some pretty big celebrities before I found you. Um, and they said, why aren't you doing, why aren't you doing this for television? Like you have a bigger audience than a lot of TV shows. I said, I don't know how to do TV. I have a handy cam and like my, my computer and I create my own content. So that's sort of where this came from, uh, moving from a five minute format to a 30 minute format. Um, we started talking about it. The co-producer on the show is Andrew Zimmern from the Travel Channel, MSNBC, What's Eating America. We've been friends for 15 years. And he said, let's shop this around. And I said, look, I want to do television that's important and has the ability to change the world. And for five years, I heard, it's too smart. Nobody's going to watch it. So no network would fund this at the time. So I said, fine, I'll just go out and find my own money and do it, which is what we did for two years. And then Discovery Channel just took it. So there is a market for stuff like this. You just have to, if you're going to be the first person in the space, you just go get it done. Cool. And Carrie, uh, having had the privilege to watch the first season, uh, not once but twice, Crash Test World aligns so well with all the projects that you've done in the past. How did you get connected to the production? And what got you excited about the concept? Well, uh, Jenny just cold called me, actually. I was in a hotel room and uh, <laughs> we have a mutual friend that I was working on a show with and he gave her my phone number and I talked to her for like an hour. It was easy. <laughs> it was like she was an old friend and we have the same ethos. Um, we believe in smart TV. We believe in not underestimating the intelligence of our audience. And I also would like to change the world and make it better. So we became friends instantly and this was an easy transition. Cool. Carrie's, well, Carrie's the only person I wanted to host this show. Yeah. And the introduction over Twitter was, hey, you two should know each other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no pressure. You've got only Carrie lined up as your optimal host. And the first time she heard from you was a cold call. That's I canceled amazing. the first call with her because I freaked out. I'm like, I'm too nervous. Shut up. Um, because I was so in awe of her. I'm like, she's never going to want to work with me. Um, so yeah, the first call was canceled. The second one, I needed like a pep talk for my friends and family. Like, how am I going to talk to this woman who has had a TV show and I've never had a TV show? show? See, I thought it was game because, like, <laughs> look how busy I am. <laughs> you want to get with this? <laughs> all right. Well, to help all of you have some context for what we're talking about, we're going to show a five-minute clip from Crash Test World. So, Carrie, maybe you can set up the segment we're about to see. So this is from our Israel episode, which was how do we live in peace in a place of great conflict? Because everything you see on the news about Israel is it's explosive and it's negative and it's how people don't get along. So we're looking for the innovators and the inventors and the, the game changers in youthful situations that want to make the world a better place, they want to get along, they have hope. So this was the culmination of the whole episode coming together and this is where we all break bread together. No matter what religion you are or what language you speak, there's one thing in Israel that most everyone here can agree on. The joys of the mighty sesame seed. Whoa, yes, good, yes, delicious. Hello. Oh, it smells amazing in here. I'm meeting with Palestinian chef Kamal Hashlaman at a shop just outside Jerusalem. One could say he's a sesame seed expert. Oh, this is the stone that I'm producing with a tahini. I've never seen this made before. He uses this massive stone to crush sesame seeds and turn them into a prized paste called tahini. Tahini is have a rich flavor of the sesame. Mmm. It's creamy. Yeah. Peanut butter. There's only sesame inside. Tahini has a nutty flavor and a peanut butter-like texture. 
It's used throughout Israel and surrounding countries to make some of the tastiest dishes of Middle Eastern cuisine. Chefs of all faiths and backgrounds covet Kamel's tahini. This is the machine that we toast it, the sesame with it. Here you can have some in your hand. Oh, it's warm. I know that they are ready, but the, the, I hear them. You see, you can feel the small crunchy or it tells you that they are ready, you know, they are happy to be tahini. Tahini time! <laughs> tahini is versatile and can even be eaten as a confection. Halva is made from the tahini. In the Arabic name of the halva, it means the sweet. Halva is the sweets. Yes, this is the uh, rose. I would like <gasps> for you a little bit to taste it. I love eating flowers. I don't know, maybe it's the girliness in me, but I love to eat flowers. Roses. It melts in your yeah, mouth. That is so good. I mean, it's amazing that that one tiny little seed has so exactly. many different manifestations. It has so many. We'll take the tahini for us for the dinner. Ready to go? I'm ready. Yeah. One of the best ways to bring people together is over food. And Israel is one of the richest and most incredible food scenes anywhere on Earth. I've been invited to a friend's farm for a special dinner called Shabbat. Here's our dough. Israeli chef Hidai Ofaim hosts Shabbat every Friday night. I do a very simple challah, just three pieces, and we make a braid. Chef Hidai makes challah, a traditional Jewish bread essential to every Shabbat meal. You're gonna do the next one? Yep. Shabbat dinner is a 2,000-year-old Jewish tradition that marks the beginning of the day of rest. I think the best present I got from the Jewish people is Shabbat. It begins at sunset on Friday and ends at sunset on Saturday. We try and bring to the table the best meal of the week because when you make something to your children and to your family on a Friday night, they know you made it for them. So you connect through food. Definitely. I, well, I connect everything through food. We love to have guests from different backgrounds that are not Jewish. We love to share this experience with our closest neighbors, <laughs> the Palestinians. Okay, we're gonna have this, scoop out the flesh, and then he's gonna add tahini. Chef Kamel's tahini makes it into several of the dishes. The baba ganoush? Yes. Including this roasted eggplant dish called baba ganoush. Beautiful! Ah. Oh. I'm excited. See? So we try to have uh, as many guests as our table can have. It's a pretty big table. <laughs> Photojournalist Noam joins Ahmed and Rima from Muna. Shalom Aleichem, a blessing is said over the bread. Amen. And then it's broken and passed around so everyone can share in the blessing. So it's a prayer, and then eat. Then eat. Okay. Is that the game? I want to try it all. You should try that. It's got the fancy tahini in it. So do you feel like breaking bread together is a way to get past cultural differences? Or I don't want to get over cultural differences. I want to embrace cultural differences. And food is one way to do that, because we can bring all the cultural differences to the table. Food tastes better on Shabbat. <laughs> Spending time together is more meaningful on Shabbat. We're supposed to speak in English now? I speak English, yeah. yeah. Arabic? <laughs> no? Just Only English? I know, right? But I do speak food, and this is delicious. Yeah. See, that's more that's important than language. Like, yeah. The universal language that everybody understands. I mean, I sat down with people from so many different backgrounds and experiences. And we're all laughing, smiling, and sharing a meal. So it's very tasty. <laughs> it's so good. You know, it's delicious. Oh my God, that was the best meal I ever had. It was so much food. It was so good. And it took hours to cook, and they got everything from the garden that's all growing outside. It was so nice. I have a hard time watching it because it's the best bread I've ever had. It was so good. And everybody who was sitting at the table had been in the episode. So we had visited a tech camp for kids where they spoke five different languages, but everybody communicated on creating a drone. And we had been to um, Surfing for Peace out in a village where it, it brought 
different religions out into the water and they left politics on the shore. Um, and skateboarders. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. We have our photojournalist who is also a skateboarder that as a teenager got a skate park built so that the kids could play together in a, you know, in the community rather than, you know, bring their parents fights. Yeah. So the, the point of that show is when we eat together, when we build together and when we play together, peace is possible. Um, and I think it's so interesting that you picked this one because this was actually my least favorite of the six episodes. Really? But it is the most requested one when I screen because people say to me, I never thought about this aspect of Israel. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's the one that definitely struck me. I mean, I love the whole series. That one really stuck with me. Yeah. And, you know, so using this as an example, how do you, there's so many things you could cover. Uh, break down how you approach topics you decide to cover, the groups you choose to spotlight. I'm sure some is logistics, but uh, but kind of go through that process. Um, so as the series creator, I come with some really like insane ideas. You know, I'm, I'm like, can we do, do walls work? Is that too political right now? Um, and how can we take the history of the Berlin Wall and bring in Syrian refugees and do this in 22 minutes for a family audience? And the co-production company looks at me like I'm insane. Um, but each show is divided into four stories or four acts. So we know that there, it's very formulaic. We have one question for each episode, and then what are four stories that can serve that? Um, I usually have a pretty good idea of what I want. Carrie's um, keeps saying DJs, skateboarders, uh, artists. So we try to bring that in as much as possible because it, we know if you're gonna relate to those people, then that helps drive the story. We look for local storytellers under 30 years old to drive this, this um, point home. And we find a lot of them on Instagram. So the photojournalist skateboarder, we found him on Instagram. Uh, Muna, the, if you watch the whole episode, the, the tech for good building um, quadcopters, we found them on Instagram. So you just type in like who's doing multi-faith, multi, -faith, multi uh, and you can find people that way. Um, and I live with my beta <laughs> testing audience. I have a 10 year old Absolutely. daughter who loves Instagram and loves YouTube and loves all of that. So I, I, I can, you know, okay, what do you think of that? And she also yeah. likes DJs and skateboarders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, the idea of the show is we take one question, one big question, and how are people trying to solve these questions? So it's solution-based television. Um, and if you think of the big questions of our time, how do we live in peace? How do we fe feed an ever-growing planet? How do we protect our water? I mean, these questions are never going to go away. So this is just limitless television here. You could do a whole season just on food alone. And then, Carrie, for you uh, preparing for these episodes, um, how much of it is sort of planned ahead of time? How much of it is just your natural experience of the moment? Because so, it certainly comes across as, as, as your reactions come across as very genuine. I just crash test it, <laughs> I dive right in and ask a lot of questions. I'm very curious. And I ask the questions that I wanna know and they generally are the same questions that a, a kid might ask. I'm very curious. So all of these experiences are genuine. I mean, that's what made Mythbusters very successful is that we were learning along with the audience and we were experiencing along with the audience. Nothing was canned ahead of time, except for those awful blueprints, hated those. But you know, it was just, you're watching me see an explosion for the first time, you're gonna feel that experience. So I don't really prep for this as, um, other than learning maybe a pronunciation of some names that are a little hard to roll off my tongue. Yeah, so the only thing that's scripted is the introduction and then the outro, that's it. And then I would say you do prep because we do talk to you about where we're going, where we're going, cultural sensitivities. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not you're coming in with like, you spend weeks here, prepping. <laughs> here is my list of questions. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's always so different once you get there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so Jenny, you've designed Crash This World. You've talked about this a little bit to be incorporated in the classroom. Uh, you know, go in a little more detail about how that works, what you've learned from the initial experiences of bringing it into the classroom. Yeah, so um, as I said before, when I started, everything was um, to bring the world into the classroom. All the content we were doing was under five minutes. So when I got presented with the challenge to do a 30-minute television show, I didn't know how to do that. I know how to tell a story in five minutes. That's honestly what, uh, that's honestly everyone's attention span. Um, that's what a teacher can v show in a classroom and then have a conversation. If you're doing a half an hour, it just doesn't work. It's just bad teaching practice. So when we were designing this show, working with Andrew Zimmern's production company, they know how to do the 30 to 60 minute. But I said, we need to make sure that everything can be broken down into very clear, concise, 
points for the classroom and you don't have to watch one piece or the other. So a teacher could take the piece you just saw and just use that and just talk about food as, as a uniter. So the show was developed two ways. Um, we, we have to look at it from this is how somebody would view a five minute segment and then this is the conversation they would have in a classroom. This is how it would be presented on the web. And then this is the 22 to 30 minute cut, um, which is a very different way of thinking about television. Um, and if you look at things like Blue Planet, Planet Earth, they try to slice it up, but it wasn't done that way initially. Um, so this is how we're looking at all of the content we're doing right now. And we travel with teachers who yeah, we do. pull the curriculum the way yeah. it should be presented and make the lesson plans and make the curriculum. Yeah. I, mean, I think that answers a question I was going to ask and decide to skip over is that the, the information density in this show, it's so entertaining, but it's so the signal to noise ratio to be a little geeky appropriately for Google okay. is really high. Like the, okay. the amount of information for the amount of minutes is really high. So Carrie, um, how has being a parent influenced your approach to Crash Test World? And have you managed to get a cameo or two for your daughter? <laughs> how, are, are there any parents in here? So yes. you realize that most of the things you do are to impress your kids because like, <laughs> being cool mom is the best thing in the world. So I started making TV a long time ago that appeals to kids and I love seeing how proud she is of me. So I love going into this thinking, what would my daughter like to see? What questions would Stella ask right now? Like if she were in this situation, what would she want to know? And it actually helps me ask the right questions. She's very smart and she's very inquisitive. And I spend a lot of time explaining very complex things to her. So it's it's been amazing to be informed by a 10-year-old. Very cool. And if, you, if you're a Toxic Googles fan, go back to earlier interviews with Carrie and you'll see some of the amazing sculptures she's made for her daughter. And so did, there is I a was, cameo. I was going to say, did you get Stella in? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's a good picture of me freaking out. <laughs> they didn't tell me they were going to do this. And <laughs> it was a very scary experience being on a kite board. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, my, my daughter came with me on an episode where we were eating bugs. And she was really excited about that because she wanted to see me eat bugs. And... Uh, she got a little cameo in one of our episodes, and I think she's going to be pretty excited to see that on TV. Yeah. This is my favorite photo of all, uh, a view of the Falcon, <laughs> and uh, from the Cutter episode, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, so what was it like being up and close to a Falcon, and do Falcons really get passports? They do. Yeah. Fal the Falcons are big business over there. They are really important. They have to a hospital. They have a Falcon hospital. <laughs> it's like a rite of passage to get your Falcon. That's like, I got a Boston Terrier. I mean, <laughs> kids are get Falcons. <laughs> no, it's, um, falconry is a tradition. It's a tradition of hunting. It's, it's something passed down through generations. So it's very important culturally to them. And uh, being that close to a Falcon was very cool. Also sort of terrifying. Those talents our serious business. And when we first got out to the desert and that bird was flying around, they told us not to move because the falcon might think that we're what they need to attack. So Jenny and I were like, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even moving my head. They're like, well, you can move a little bit. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty awesome. By the end, I was like, oh, I want to hold the falcon. <laughs> but perhaps not the best uh, gift pet for uh the holidays i mean for me give me a falcon <laughs> absolutely i will put, i'll take that were you thinking of one well i was uh, i could put that on my, my my list did you hear rustling in the gift bag Yay! yeah <laughs> it's a google falcon it's like hogwarts but with falcons here right yes our falcon has come with the google so assistant fun. all right there's a the plug <laughs> i wow. like how you you matched though that day like your outfit matches the falcon i mean that's how you have to roll in television it's like coordination so you touched on this a little bit, but you've covered some really complex topics. Uh, the Berlin Wall, Syrian refugees. How do you approach these complex topics while keeping it accessible to a wide range of students? I don't know how I know how to do this. Um, I've just been doing it for 17 years. I know and when you work with a lot of kids, so we consult a lot of parents, teachers, and students on what they're interested in. So if I were to go to Thailand and film at an elephant sanctuary, what are your top five questions? Well, after you do that for 17 years, you know what the top five questions are. How do you keep it so it doesn't get complex? You, you just have to know where not to pull the thread. So when we were doing the Berlin Wall, I'm like, we're not gonna mention 
World War II. We're not going to mention Hitler because everything becomes a separate story. So you have to keep it very, very concise. Like what if I only have five minutes to give you something, what can I give you? Because the second you go down another rabbit hole, that becomes another episode. Um, you also can't make assumptions. You can't assume that Somebody, they know what the Cold War, cold war is. is. Because when you ask little kids, they're like, well, it, it was fought when it was cold. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when we, so we, we film everything, and then we've got a story writer who goes back and, and writes the narration. And then before I approve it, um, I run it by, by teachers and say, where, where would there be an issue in your classroom that you're going to have to explain something? Um, and I, I, we just have it now, and our story writers understand it now. Because when we first started, people are like, oh, this is hard to dumb down. I'm like, it's not dumbing it down. It's simplifying it. It's yeah. just that that's, they're two very different things, especially kids. They're so smart. Like, and when we say kids, like this is watched by kids as young as seven years old, and they get it. Um, we've had seven-year-olds ask for the next episode. Um, so they want to be challenged. Yeah, well, I think what's amazing of this show is it ladders up from from a, such a wide age range, like that as an adult watching it, I just, this is a fantastic show where there's just so much information packed into a yeah. short amount of time, except that you could also show it to kids and yeah. they would get it. So yeah. it's not a kid show, it's not an adult show. If you were watching it at home, you wouldn't know that it was designed, it's co-viewing. And there's like no co-viewing on television right now, other than like competition shows. So like Great British Bake Off, like you can sit down and watch that with your family, but there's really nothing like this. And there used to be stuff like this when I was a kid. Like, oh, I, I'll, I'll date myself, but Mutual of Omaha, like we used to sit down at that as a family and watch like about wildlife and then have a conversation. There's nothing like this right now. So the uh, New York City episode, and that's a place where you don't want to take a wrong step. Uh, the New York City episode included some terrific examples of making cities more livable. And there are lots of examples from the series. What ideas excite both of you the most as residents of large cities from the experiences you had doing Crash Test World? I loved that we covered greening the city because any place you can find a little bit of green, like not only is it aesthetically pleasing, but it's also, it's functional. You want to breathe better. So you definitely want plants around. And we actually worked with this man named Stephen Ritz and his program to teach kids in some of the, the, uh, schools how to yeah, yeah. underprivileged in, schools, in underserved communities underserved yeah. communities how to grow food how to grow vegetables how to do that indoors in these amazing towers where they you know they showed us how to grow lettuce indoors in towers in the middle of the bronx and i thought that was really fascinating and my favorite was the recycling from that so oh, yes. we followed we 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 took shampoo bottles and put Carrie's face on them and we followed through the whole recycling process from when you throw it curbside in the recycling bin to where it goes and we learned that coffee cups are not recyclable because it's paper and plastic put together and you can recycle one or the other but when they're put together and then we found out the number one thing that people throw in recycling that's not recycling in New York City bowling balls um, they so have I a think bin it, of bowling balls um, seriously this is in the episode but I think what what was done so beautifully in that episode it wasn't like this is why you need to recycle this is how you recycle like it actually showed you like the whole and it's fun like it, it really makes you want to like solve that problem um, so I, that's my favorite and, and it's actionable, right? Like a kid can watch that and say, I'm gonna stop using coffee cups. Like, I'm gonna stop. Your kid drinks coffee? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but their parents, their parents. <laughs> but that's that's the whole point. Like, you know, I said to my dad, he's like, well, no, you know, they, uh, my dad's in his 70s. Like, no, they have the recycling symbol. I'm like, because it's made from recycled products, but once you throw that in, it's not recycled again. Um, and he's got, you know, we've got a six and a half year old niece and she knows that now. Like when you go to the store, she watched this and she knows like, don't take that. Get your, get your mug like this <laughs> um, and stop using that. And that's the power. I just love the New York City one because there were so many actionable things out of there that like every person can do. We geeked out so hard and they're all the conveyor belts. <laughs> They've got lasers that shoot like all of the orange cans go over here and all of the white plastic. That was my best here. day. You said that was your best that day on the whole. That was so much fun. <laughs> and to see the immense amount of recycling that comes in on the barge and they're like, yeah, um, small percentage of New York recycles. I'm like, this is a small percentage. Like, yeah. well, that's just one barge. That, that's, that's the morning shift. Like yeah. this afternoon, all that again. It's insane. I can't even imagine how much we waste. 
that's just the the percentage that we recycle. Yeah. yeah. So you also spent time closer to home, talking about geeking out. Uh, right here in the Bay Area, looking at tech innovations, what emerging tech has you the most excited? Oh my God, there's so much. <laughs> I mean, I loved what we saw with prosthetics and 3D printing and the commercial space. I love commercial space. I love that we have people that are learning how to 3D print in space in the Bay Area. I'm fascinated by the fact that we are doing, you know, these AI EV cars that are, you know, autonomous, driving around with no drivers, that's insane. Like, how is the future all just here in the Bay Area and it's all happening? And everyone I talk to has some sort of job doing something that hasn't even been invented as a job yet. Like, you can't tell a kid that they're gonna go work on this because it, it, it doesn't, doesn't exist, exist yet. <laughs> It's, it's just very cool. And you work at Google, so you know. You know. <laughs> that, I think, was the hardest episode to do because the, the theme of the episode is how can we, how can we use technology for good? Uh, there were like a thousand stories that came in in like a 24-hour period. So like going through each one, um, I think we had more information than anything else. Uh, for that episode. Which means we can do like 10 more episodes, so we better get like 10 more seasons. <laughs> so we're gonna take questions from all of you in, in just a minute, but just a couple more questions. So what's next for Crash Test World? What problems would you like to crash test? What parts of the world are you most excited to explore? Season two, we're gonna start filming probably in May or June. Um, questions we're looking at, how can humans live in space? Um, how can we conserve and protect water? Water is the resource, uh, the resource that touches every single aspect of our lives and people forget like when they turn on the tap that there's a real cost to it. Um, can one voice change the world? Can one voice change the world? Um, and what can we do about the climate emergency? So those are the questions where just, you know, tiny, just like, like tiny, tiny little, little questions. questions. Uh, Not very heavy subject matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, here's the thing is we've got these incredibly complex questions. But as Jenny says, you come at it from a place of learning and it's, it's easy. It's easy because you just keep asking questions yeah. and somewhere in there you find that beautiful little morsel of hope. That yeah. I have never walked away from a job every single day and just been like, wow, I just want to tell everybody about this. Yeah. Okay, I mean like sort of Mythbusters. <laughs> So just uh, one last question for me, uh, for both of you. Uh, based on everything you've seen in season one and experience, how do you feel about the future? Um, I mean, this whole show, I, I don't see doom and gloom. My whole job is to feature people working towards solutions. Um, I just think we need to collaborate more. I think the answers to like all of our problems are out there already. It's just connecting the dots and collaborating. So I love this. I love... Um, yeah, I don't feel negative about the future. I feel incredibly positive, especially when you work with people like 10 to 30 years old because they're going to fix it. Like my generation, I'm older than that. We've screwed it up. We're not going to fix it. But this generation, the Greta Thunberg generation, is just going to get it done. I mean, when I get mired in the negativity of the news feed, nothing makes me feel more hopeful than walking away from a day on this job because you actually, I, I think that by spreading the hope, I think it's contagious and... Otherwise, you just kind of think, oh, there's nothing I can do. I'm not going to recycle. But if you see that people are actually doing something with it, you're like, oh, OK, maybe maybe I can make a difference. And we just need everybody to think that I can make a difference. Not your uh, best advice, but what is your favorite advice to give to new parents? Just keep wiping. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to make it through. You just keep wiping. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for making content like this, a similar content, you know, such, such as Mythbusters, but also other um, similar series were de definitely very influential in my childhood. Now, when I think about it, for my parents, it was very easy to guide me towards content like this. They, they were like, you know, let's just put on Discovery Channel. There's probably something halfway useful on there. Um, but now today, when a lot more kids consume content through online channels, uh, how do you reach out to them and, you know, uh, uh, how do you push your content towards uh, people it can benefit? Did you plant this guy in the audience? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so um, version 2.0 of Project Explorer, the underlying nonprofit for this. Um, we are starting our own um, SVOD for classrooms. So everybody's getting into the SVOD space. I know this. Um, 
but we've been around for 17, streaming Jenny, video, streaming video on demand, <laughs> streaming video on demand, um, which will be, we're already in 5,300 schools in the United States. So it's not just gonna be crash test world anymore. We're doing financial literacy, we're doing sex education, we're doing mental health, mini documentaries, uh, day in the life of kids around the world. It'll be one stop shop for anything you could ever wanna learn. Um, so that's our, and you're the first audience to hear this because this is a brand new initiative we're working on. That's what I was going to say. I thought that was a secret. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Carrie, Carrie is um, uh, one of our very first people in the door helping us with that. So Crash Test World will live on that platform. Um, and then some of the other series we work, we're working on will also live on Discovery. But Discovery is not just for kids. You know, there's... There's really no one portal, so that's Myth what we're Mythbusters doing. was eight to eighty men and women, yeah. so all the advertisers yeah. loved it. <laughs> and I think it's it's that family viewing that gets me excited. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And again, really cool to see you here. Thanks. Thank you. So you guys have both had interesting careers, um, <laughs> to say the least. So experience is something you don't get until after you need it. For each of you in your careers, what would that most pivotal bit of experience be? that if you could have figured out a way to prepare earlier, you would have? I think I would have gotten an agent earlier <laughs> in the seasons of Mythbusters. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I, feel like, I feel like I'm still learning. I mean, I really am. Ever since I, I met Jenny, I feel like I've had an entire education on how to present in an entirely new way. I was very intimidated when we were going to interview Syrian refugees. When I'm interviewing scientists on what they do, it's I can ask all these questions, there's no off limits, but the sensitivity really, it, I, was, I was scared. I, was like, I didn't want to ask the wrong questions. I didn't want to um, present in the wrong way. And I, you know, talking to somebody who's been doing documentaries for the past <laughs> 17 years, she had amazing advice for me. So I, I think it was a pivotal moment for me right before I went into that interview where she's just like, come from a place of learning. There's no inappropriate questions if you're really curious about what you want to ask. And it was a very important pivotal moment for me. The two of you have decades of experience making video. Uh, so I'm wondering how you think about the way that whole industry is changing. Um, it used to be there were a few places where people went to find video content. Nowadays, the number of people making video for a living has exploded. So what advice would you have for someone who wants to make videos, educational or otherwise, for a living? And uh, what do you think is important to know nowadays? Or how do you think about choices you've made in distributing your video? It's a well, tough question. I mean, this is this is the new Wild West. Yeah. This is exactly how I felt when Mythbusters started. It was the Wild West of cable. You had your networks, and then you had your periphery sort of cable channels, you know, that Discovery went from, you know, animal documentaries to all of a sudden they had this, you know, reality-based shows with dirty jobs and, and crab fishermen and, you know, the deadliest catch and Mythbusters, <laughs> and they had all of these shows that were coming up, and it... It was just when cable was changing and getting bigger, and now there's thousands of channels, and the next generation is making video content in smaller bite-sized pieces, and it's doing it on the inter internet. It's doing it on these subscription bases. So it's exciting for me because I feel like I am having a, I'm, I'm living a second time in the beginning of a new way of showing video and showing content. So I'm excited about it, but I also came with the cachet of the past, so it's a little easier for me to start. People who are just beginning, I do not envy. It is really hard in such a saturated market. You have to find your voice. You yeah. have to find your audience because everything is pigeonholed and very niche now. So you have to find the people in your audience that are passionate, you know? You gotta find your Bernie Sanders style of passionate audience that follows you to the end. I'd say it's it's the point of view. Um, and I, I, like, why should we care what we're watching? And anytime like a young filmmaker says like, I wanna go out and tell, I'm like, why should I, why should I watch this? Why should I give you 10 minutes of my time? And if they can't answer that, I'm like, go back to the drawing board. Um, so that's like the biggest advice I give to people. Um, I will also say we've been, in launching this new business, we've been doing a lot of research on what people are consuming. And the biggest thing that keeps coming through for us is we like the human element. When you tell a story, you connect with people. 
Um, so, and that can be done. You can do that with science. You can do that with math. Just not let, tell a human story. People want to connect with other human beings. Mm -hmm. um, the most popular YouTube channel is a kid unboxing toys mm -hmm. because kids want to see other kids. Yep. Um, I mean, if that, you never think that that would be popular, right? So point of view and then use stories to tell whatever it is you want to do. Thank you. And we learned early on, you want to talk about the refugee crisis? You tell the story of one refugee. One, yeah. One thing that really struck me, uh, both watching the video and just in general interacting with you, is how warm you are and how even in these situations where you're bridging cultural differences, you had to be trained ahead of time, uh, it still seems like you're able to get to know people who are very, very different and easily socialize in that way. I was wondering, do you have any advice in terms of how you build that skill set and also for other people who maybe find it difficult to just, who want to get to know people who are different, but find that difficult uh, around how to do that? I mean, I grew up a very shy person, which <laughs> people don't necessarily believe me, but I, I was extremely shy. So learning how to talk to people and I genuinely am interested in other people's stories. I think you just can't sit there and think about what the next question is. Mm -hmm. You have to really listen to what they're saying and dive in and respond to what they're saying because you are interested in it. It's, um, it's never an agenda. It's just a conversation. And I just like people. <laughs> I like stories. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time in your world travels <laughs> to come and stop by Google and share the story of Crash Test World with you. I encourage everybody to check it out when it comes out on Discover in the near future. Some of it you can watch on projectexplorer.org. So you can watch the first three episodes broken down into those five minute chunks that I was telling you about. So and when all that. of your kids are like, you know, <laughs> indoors because of the coronavirus, you can like homeschool them with the lesson. Pandemic <laughs> safe. Pandemic <laughs> safe. Pandemic <laughs> safe. <laughs> P.S. I'm not doing handshakes anymore. So like some of yeah. these. <laughs> and what did you say? The high Wi-Fi? The Wi-Fi. Like, wi yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> I feel like that is like geeky safe. <laughs> so round of applause for Carrie and Jenny. Thank you. Thank you.